Well, if we take a look at the calendar on the wall, it's Friday. Let's look at plays. Stick around. Greetings and welcome back to another episode of Five Play Friday, the show where we look at plays, National Federation of High School Basketball Rules, officials, were they correct in their positioning and the adjudication on the play, habits that are displayed that we can take with us and take into our game, both positives that we can embrace and negatives that we can avoid. Greetings again, everybody. My name is Greg Austin with TheBetterOfficial.com. We craft video to help basketball officials get better and take control of their officiating career. If you haven't already done so, great time to hit like, subscribe, notify, so you don't miss out on any of our new content, including live streams every Wednesday and Friday, 7 a.m. Pacific, 10 a.m. Eastern. As always, we are supported by a fantastic group of show supporters. Today, I'd like to give a shout out to Kevin Swan, Thomas Lyons, Marlon Diub, David York, and Greg Becker. Much appreciated and much love. You want to support the show, you can always buy us a coffee. There will be a link in the show notes below. All right, so this week we've been focusing on the throw-in in National Federation of High School Basketball rules. Knowing the restrictions, knowing what a violation is, knowing what's legal, and not being surprised on plays. If we focus on throw-in plays, we get great bang for our buck. There are a lot of throw-ins in the average high school basketball game. Knowing the rules and restrictions gives us the confidence that if anything happens in our game, we will know how to adjudicate it properly. Throw-ins are important. We've been focusing on it this week. If you've missed either of the previous two episodes in this week's series, the Masterclass and the Basketball Rules Expert episode, there will be a link above and in the show notes below. All right, let's get started today with our very first play. And he misses the second as well. It's astonishing. Luigi says forget it. Walden to inbound. Yeah, you're not allowed to run along the sideline there, at the end line rather. Yeah, you're not allowed to do that. All right, so we have a designated spot throw in play. Pretty straightforward. The official designates the spot, hands the ball to the thrower, the ball becomes live, so our temporary rules and restrictions during a throw-in, one of the three restarts in the game of basketball, during a jump ball, free throw, and a throw-in, special set of rules that apply only during the restart, so only during the throw-in here, but that player, that thrower, has a designated spot, which is an area three feet wide, of which they must keep one of their feet above. That's the key. So this player's behavior on this play, if we look at it, right, if we look at the behavior of the player here, the designated spot would be approximately the area of the white triangle, approximately the width of the white triangle. But they must keep one of their feet above the throw-in area. And on this, on this play, they fail to do so. Right? Once he moves that right foot from above that area, th at that point, the player has violated. So it's not a matter of a step to the right and a step to the left. It's a matter of keeping one foot above that area. And when you fail to do so, it is a violation by rule. So super simple obvious play to get us started, but what we, the one thing we have to understand is knowing the basics of 
violations, rules and restrictions. We have to know what the thrower's restrictions are because again, throw-ins, many things will occur in our game. A lot of unique situations will occur during, during throw-ins because a lot of throw-ins occur. So we have to have a couple of things going for us. One is we have to know the rules and restrictions, be confident in that. The other is we have to not react when something unusual happens because unusual things will happen. We need to process, evaluate, and put the correct ruling on the play. The correct ruling on this play, call correct by the official, love the mechanics, the demeanor, right? Everything about the way the official handled themselves, all is stuff we would want to model as basketball officials. Okay, all right, let's move on to the next play. Apologies for the glitchy video on that, but another great basic play, a five second violation. Once the ball is at the disposal of the thrower, they have five seconds to release the throw in pass. Okay? But it's also a great situation. Look at the, all right, we have a one point game between two high powered uh, uh, college programs with a minute to go in overtime. Right? So it just reinforces the fact that. If we are, if we have developed habits and fundamentals so that our count is strong, our count is accurate, then when we get into a high pressure situation, we're going to perform, right? So we would want to bring practiced effort into this situation. I didn't put a clock on it. Looks like the official accelerates a little bit. And, you know, one of the things we're going to naturally do. Um, in a count situation is potentially accelerate as we anticipate, oh, we're going to have a five second violation and go a little faster. So when we watch our game video, we want to look and see if we exhibit that behavior and try to fix it and correct it and understand it. I apologize for the glitchy video there. That's challenging to look at on a regular basis. Let's move on to play number three. Right. So a, a great example of something unusual happening on a throw in. Right. When something unusual happens, we need to process the play and say, OK, that is wildly unusual. I've never seen that before. But was there a violation by rule? And if there is, we can always come a little bit late, recognize that we're going to have some processing time. We can always come a little bit late, but let's put the correct ruling on the play. So what is the correct ruling in this scenario? Um, obviously, a not a designated spot throw in the players moving along the end line and slips on a wet spot on the floor, goes down, the ball comes out of their hands, bounces, and then an opponent of the thrower picks up the ball and scores. What do you have on this play? Well, what we know something funny has happened, but what are the rules and restrictions? A throw-in pass must be passed directly onto the court. 
a thrower is not allowed to bounce the ball out of bounds prior to going on to the court. When this ball touches the floor, does it have out of bounds status or inbound status? That would be the key question on this play. If we look at where the ball lands, pretty clearly out of bounds, on the line, out of bounds, should have been a throw in violation in this scenario. Right? But this, a play like this really emphasizes the fact, and I can't stress it enough, is that unusual things can happen on throw-in plays. Because they are so frequent, unusual things can happen, and we have to be just prepared for that and not have an immediate reaction when something untoward happens. Right? Give ourselves a little processing time. Say, well, wait a minute. I know what's illegal, and that did not qualify. Or, I know what's illegal, and that did qualify. So this is a great example of that. That's another factor as well, is if we're not sure that the ball bounced on the court, our default should be, no, if we're not sure that the ball bounced out of bounds, our default should be legal play. That's until, uh, it's a legal play, legal play, legal play, and until I'm sure it bounced out of bounds, if it bounced out of bounds, violation by rule. So we've had two basic plays. We've had one wildly unique play. Let's look at our very next video. All right, another simple play, designated spot throw in, player, only restriction, keep one foot above the three foot wide throw in spot. When they jump with both feet off of that spot, they have violated by rule. Obviously an important part of this game, two point game, etc. but it's an obvious violation. So we put the obvious violation into the game. Simple play. Put it here to reinforce our understanding of a designated spot throw-in. Again, we're hammering home the basics with these plays. Basics, basics, basics. Oh my gosh, what's that? Something unusual. Basics, basics, basics. If we understand the rules and restrictions, we can adjudicate these plays. All right, let's look at our very next play. This is not a play that happens every day, right? So now we've, we've, we've hammered home the basics. Now we move on to an exotic play. When this happens in your game, it's like, whoa, what just happened? How do we adjudicate that play, right? That's our, it may be obvious to somebody on the crew, but it would be understandable. Have I ever seen this before in my game? Maybe no, maybe yes, right? But it's not a common scenario, right? The thrower releases the throw-in pass. The throw-in pass goes into the basket. Either basket, it's a violation by rule. If the thrower released the throw-in pass and it got lodged between the basket and the backboard, it would also be a violation by rule. Simple. I know that's illegal. I know the rules and restrictions. 
That gives me the freedom to confidently adjudicate throw-in plays. But when something unique happens, it may take us a moment. We could work together as a crew here and, 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 and say, okay, one member of the crew says, violation by rule, throw in back at the original spot, et cetera, et cetera. So another unique play that we've thrown into the mix that gives us, can give us pause on the court, but this is clearly a violation by rule. All right, so we've had three meat and potatoes, basic designated spot, basic violations, five second violation, super simple, two unique plays. Let's look at our very next play. Okay, so we're back to the unique, unusual. How do we adjudicate, right? So obviously we're, we're after a timeout here, late in a game, close game. Team develops a strategy where they're going to have all of the players for the throwing team. This is a not a designated spot throw-in. Player can move along the end line. All of the teammates of the thrower are positioned out of bounds before the play begins. Is that legal? We have to know that. We have to know that. What are the rules and restrictions during a designated spot throw-in? What are the rules and restrictions during a non-designated spot throw-in? During a non-designated spot throw-in, teammates of the thrower are allowed to be out of bounds. Usually this would happen after a made basket during play, multiple teammates uh, maybe out of bounds, etc. It's illegal for teammates to pass the ball out of bounds. Legal. Understanding that. Coming out of a timeout, though, there is no restriction. After a timeout, there is no restriction, and the players are allowed to be at that part of the court. It's done in an effort to fool the defense, get them confused, etc. But it is a legal play by rule. Now, something that's fun about this is the official has to figure out, well, wh how am I going to administer this throw-in, right? That's, a, that's sort of a fun part of the play. This is not going to be covered in the mechanics manual. Um, but it's great to see these plays on video so that when they happen in our game, right? So as officials, we want to anticipate things late in the game. So we have 16.6, team is down by three. Right? Let's assume that. It's 86-83, I assume they're the home team, that they're down by three. So, on a throw-in play, what may they do? What, what do we anticipate happening? At this point of the game, we want to have all of our I's dotted and T's crossed. We know how many timeouts are remaining, what kind of throw-in we have coming in, what we anticipate may happen in the game, not anticipating a call that we're going to make, but anticipating what may happen in the game. So there could be some play, you know, when the game is closer, let's say it's a two-point game with very little time. Sometimes teams will run a screener and try to get a foul by the defense. We, we need to anticipate unusual plays. We could have a thrower who passes to a teammate across the court who's also out of bounds. Again, anticipating those plays. Maybe we get a heads up when we get the teams out of the huddle etc. But we want to not be surprised by these plays. And if we are surprised to just process and say, okay, is it illegal? Is it illegal? Right? In this case, no. No, it's not. This is a legal play by rule and one that's great to see on video so that when it happens in our game, we're better prepared to adjudicate the play. Okay. So, Another unusual play. Now let's talk about a discipline scenario. Let's look at our next play scenario.
Right. So, obviously, well, not obviously, it looks like a throw-in after a made basket where no member, team member, uh, no player made themselves available for the throw-in. Press, full-court press situation. The official underhand tossed to the thrower. The thrower has the ball deflect off their hand onto the court. And the official rules, what do we have? I don't even know what happened on the play. Uh, it looks like they were poised and ready to rule a violation on the play. But what do we have here? We have a one of the three restarts in the game of basketball. We must own restarts in the game of basketball. And what we absolutely need to know is, well, since a special set of rules and restrictions comes in during a restart, when does the restart start? When does the restart end? Okay, status as well. Restart starts when the ball is at the disposal of the thrower. When is the ball at the disposal of the thrower? Right? If we hand or toss the ball to the thrower or bounce the ball, as we should have in this instance, the ball is at the disposal of the thrower when they catch the basketball. So the, the throw-in here has never started by rule. Until the player catches the ball, the throw-in and rules and restrictions have not started. Contacting the basketball in this fashion, in this instance, is not the start of the reset. The official should have stopped play, reset, and ensured that the ball had the ball at the that the player had the ball at their disposal so that the throw-in could begin and we could get on with the play and the game. So in this instance, right, by the behavior of the official on the play, we see heavy processing going on, but we never get to the correct answer. The correct answer would be this throw-in has not started. We need to reset this play and re-administer the throw-in. Bounce the ball. You know, I try to encourage young officials is make a basketball pass as well. Because if you do, right, if in this instance we bounce the ball to the throw, we're too close. Right when two players are on the close are, are too close to each other on the court and they try to throw a bounce pass, invariably, right? If we create enough space to make a basketball pass as a guideline, we've created a great distance for the ball to travel and for us to be away from the play to properly adjudicate. Because one of the challenges we face when we're adjudicating throw-in plays is we've got the thrower's feet, we've got the thrower up top where they release the ball. We've got the defender's feet and we've got the defender's hands, which may be six, eight feet above the, uh, eight feet above their feet, right? So how can we ab observe all of that? We need to have better perspective on a play and be backed up. When we look at plays on video, again, we wanna take positives and we wanna take negatives, okay? Maybe there's some things on this play where the official did some things we would not want to do in our game, right? It's not something we want to model. And like we always say, when you work with other partners, there's, you're going to learn something every night. Some things to do, some things not to do, right? And that's, we can learn from others' mistakes through video, and that's one of the uh, fantastic parts of looking at plays on video. So let's look at a similar play and maybe see behavior that we could model. Let's look at our very next play. Okay, that was a weak pass. So again, on the previous play, we talked about making a bounce pass. While we bounced the ball to the thrower, it was not a bounce pass. You know, it was not passed with enough force and energy. The player reaches out, 
fails to con- to grab the ball. Sometimes players in this instance will bail you out because they have good hands and the ball bounces on the court. Immediately, build into your game the reaction that we are going to reset this throw in. Boom, every time. Just reset, make it a habit. Reset the throw in, no confusion. We get it right. Now, does this player actually violate? Let's make a determination, right? When the ball is initially fumbled and the ball contacts, has the throw in begun at this point? No, no, it hasn't, right? So in spite of that fact, right, the throw-in would begin right here where she collects the ball and has the ball at her disposal. So we could have a situation where we just let it go, but no, don't do it. Don't do it. Build the habit into your game. Immediately fix. The ball is dead. Nothing's happening. Eliminate any confusion, any possibility of a mistake here and get the play going properly in this instance. So, similar play handled more effectively, right? Displaying better habits, stop play, build this into your game, good things will happen. So we've looked today at plays, throw in plays. We've identified a couple of unique aspects. One is sometimes it's just straight meat and potatoes, easy, easy call, five second violation, designated spot, leaving the designated spot, easy violations. But we also recognize that unusual things can happen during throw-ins. And when they do, we have to give ourselves time to process. We have to recognize that we are evaluating, did something illegal occur? I know when a throw-in starts and when it ends. I know the rules and restrictions during a throw-in. Did something illegal occur? No. Did something unusual occur? Maybe. But did something illegal occur always has to be our guiding principle that we're looking for. And we just recognize that unusual things are going to happen during throw-ins because they happen so frequently in our game. So this culminates our week where we're focusing on throw-ins. And one of the things we recognize in an overriding concept is these happen a lot in our game understanding the rules and restrictions, knowing how to adjudicate properly, and knowing how to administer properly is a great area to focus on as a basketball official. It's great bang for your buck, right? I'm, I'm not so good at the jump ball restrictions. Okay, that's great. That's great. They happen once a game, right? But if I'm great at my throw-in restrictions, I'm great at my throw-in administration, I'm I'm, I'm adding, I'm taking off a big chunk of what we do as basketball officials. So it's a great area to focus on, throw in rules and restrictions. This culminates our week where we have the master class, the f- basketball rules expert, and now the five play Friday. There will be a link in the description below to the entire playlist, a great area to focus on for young basketball officials. Hey, thanks so much for sticking around to the end of the show. Much appreciated and much love. Now would be a great time to do all the things like subscribe, notify, and share the video with other basketball officials so that we can all get better together. Have to give a shout out our fantastic show and channel supporters Kevin Swan, Thomas Lyons, Marlon Dayub, David York, and Greg Becker. Much appreciated and much love. You want to support the show, you can always buy us a coffee. There will be a link above and in the show notes below. As always, here are the additional videos. Here's our master class. Here is our basketball rules expert episode. Make your choice, choose wisely, and we'll see you in the next video. Take care.